We're going to get started. Thank you for being patient with us. As you can see, there uh, is a lot of interest in this talk, um, and I don't want to keep you from our speaker, which is the reason you're here. Um, I'm Brendan Nyhan from the government department here at Dartmouth. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to this, this talk being held by the Rockefeller Center for Public Policy. I want to thank uh, the Rockefeller Center, especially Joanne Needham uh, and the Departments of Government uh, and the Programs in Quantitative Social Science and Politics and Law for sponsoring this event. Um, and we're very excited to have here Nate Cohn, who is the political correspondent for The Upshot at The New York Times, where for full disclosure, I'm also a contributor. So I think it's an awesome site you should read all the time. Um, he uh, uh, has made a name for himself in political writing in a uh, remarkably speedy time. He's a graduate from, uh, of Whitman College and uh, was working in Washington after he graduated when he started his own blog. And it was so good that the, Nas the New Republic immediately hired him and soon after The Upshot, um, when he was hired by the New York Times, Politico's story called him the New York Times' new young gun on data. Uh, Franklin Four was then the editor of the New Republic. The Nate Cohn is a star. It's been fun watching him rise. I feel the same way. Um, he also was the star of what uh, Dartmouth's own Harry Enten called uh, the great nerd fight of 2013. Um, so he has uh, remarkable bona fides when it comes to uh, working with data and politics. We're delighted to have him here to talk about uh, Obama, Trump, and the 2016 election. So please join me in welcoming him. Uh, thanks, Brendan. This is working? Great. Um, it's great to be here. I'd like to thank the Rockefeller Center and the government department for having me. It was also a great excuse uh, to come and hang out in northern New Hampshire and Vermont for a few days and go bike riding. Uh, so it's always great to get outside, especially if you're stuck in the city like I am for most of the year. Uh, the title of the talk is, Will Trump Win Obama's America? And before I get into the substance of the talk, I just really want to make sure that I provide a quick, pithy answer. That, that makes it clear whether I think that's likely or not, so that everything I say after that will be interpreted appropriately. <laughs> and that answer is probably not. Um, you know, I think that Trump is doing some really interesting things from like a composition of the, in terms of the electorate, in terms of the types of voters he's tapping into. I mean, the bottom line is that this is what the last month and a half of polling looks like nationally uh, among those polls that contact people with cell phones by any means whatsoever. And there's a, there's a pretty clear pattern here. And although, and although early polls are not necessarily perfectly accurate, there's a lot of time to change, there are some deep divisions that underlie this number. And Donald Trump has real limitations that make it difficult for him to overcome this. And the simplest reason, oh, I, I, to, to be fair, the polls that do include cell phones, that don't include cell phones, do show them doing a little better. But even among those polls that cut out a disproportionately Democratic group of young voters still tend to show Clinton in the lead. And the, the, the basic problem that Trump has, which is different than a lot of the problems that traditional candidates have, is that he is historically unpopular. And this is a chart I've borrowed from the Huffington Post that shows that 60% of voters have an unfavorable view of Donald Trump. Now, I should note that at the moment, after the FBI uh, decided not to indict Hillary Clinton, but nonetheless uh, scolded her for her extremely reckless, as I think they put it, uh, decision to have an email, uh, a private email server, her numbers are actually nearly as bad as this. Um, but there are some differences that are not reflected on this chart. It's that a larger percentage of Americans say they have a very unfavorable impression of Donald Trump, more than half which is not something that's normal and not true for Hillary Clinton despite all of her challenges. And more than half of Americans say they're afraid or scared of Donald Trump being the president, which is also very different. A lot of unpopular people have sought the presidency. Not many people have sought the presidency and won if a majority, I mean, well, no one has sought the presidency at all when a majority of them and, and won if a majority of Americans uh, said they were scared of him, let alone made it this far. Um, but I do think, that although Donald Trump probably won't win, that this talk is still interesting. Um, <laughs> and I think it, it's because I think he actually can win. Um, you know, it is fairly close. A six-point race is not a huge margin. If I may borrow from, from 538, at the moment they have uh, Clinton with about a 70% chance to win. You know, if you, things that have a, a 30%, which, which would mean a 30% chance of Trump winning. And, uh, you know, if you're a, a very good baseball player, you have a 30% chance of getting a base hit. So, you know, it's not nothing. Um, 
And there are some reasons why this race is still close. Um, you know, Hillary is very unpopular and has made a lot of mistakes that have made this race more difficult than it probably needed to be. Uh, it's also supposed to be close from a, a political science point of view. Um, the pace of economic growth is good, but it's not great. The president's party is seeking its third term in office, uh, and there's some evidence that the president's party does a little bit worse in those instances. Obama's approval rating, like the economy, it's okay, it's not great, it's in the low 50s, maybe it's even in the upper 40s like Gallup has it today. Those are numbers that are very consistent with the possibility that the, that the president's party would win, but it hardly is a lock. Um, and then I think the most interesting reason at this moment in our country's history and also um, at this moment across the developed world is that the Democratic Party and Hillary Clinton is vulnerable uh, to a populist conservative candidate. And I think that's important in its own right, whether Donald Trump wins this election. It says something important about America. It says something important that, about what's happening across the developed world. Um, and it says something important about uh, what's ha what, what the future of our country might be. And I think it's surprising in a way because the prevailing narrative of the last few elections is that the Democrats have won because they've been bolstered by sweeping demographic shifts. Huge numbers of young and non-white voters who entered the electorate and supported the president in overwhelming numbers. There were people who predicted that there would be an overwhelming Democratic majority, a permanent one even. And it's not hard to look at the data and to see why they believe that. This is the composition of the electorate over time. You can see that over the last decade and a half, the white share of eligible voters and the white share of the people that actually vote has steadily declined. That's a trend that's gonna continue for a long time. You can see why people looked at that and said the Democrats are in the driver's seat. We have such a polarized country. How many people are really persuadable? And then you add a whole bunch of new Democratic-leaning voters. How could the Republicans possibly overcome that? Um, and I think the first thing that's important to know and, is that demographics were an overrated contributor to how Obama got here. Um, here are four bar charts. 2012 election on the top, 2004 on the bottom. And look at that. John Kerry would have lost in 2012, even if the country were as diverse as it was in 2012. While President Obama would have won in 2012, even if the country were as white as it was in 2004. Oh, that's unfortunate. <laughs> and the reason for that is that there are many contributors to democratic gains over this period. Um, and I like this chart to show it, even though it's really hard to interpret in some ways. The, the y-axis is the increase in turnout. The x-axis is whether a group became more or less democratic, and every dot represents a single demographic group. So just hypothetically, this dot might here it might be an 18 to 29-year-old black woman in North Carolina without a college degree. And by the way, that's actually what that dot is. And as you can see, over the last, so the turnout among that small demographic group soared over the last decade, independently of demographic change that demographic group became incrementally more democratic. And as you can see, a whole lot of different types of voters moved, to the, moved towards the Democrats. The purple is white voters. A lot of white voters have shifted towards the Democrats. Other white voters, like um, white high schoolers, white high school educated voters over age 65 in Arkansas, have dramatically shifted the other way. But on balance, most of these dots are to the right, and the dots that are above this unchanged line for turnout are black voters who overwhelmingly supported the Democrats. None of those things are guaranteed to happen in the future. And what that meant was that John Kerry could have even won in today's diverse country. Um, and here it's broken down by group. And you can see that you know, if you had the 2004 presidential election, all you needed to get from a John Kerry loss to a win was Obama's gains among Hispanic and black voters. Not the number, not the increase in turnout, not the demographic shift, just their increased margins alone from all of those voters switching from Bush to Obama. And th those switches are extremely powerful because adding one voter gives you one more vote, but switching a vote gives you one and takes one away from your opponent. 
And so these changes in the number of voters who supported the president compared to John Kerry were far more powerful than these underlying demographic changes. And another way I can show that visually is to look at where demographic changes happened over the last 12 years. The areas in dark purple are those where the electorate has rapidly become more diverse. The areas that are lighter or even in green are areas where the electorate hasn't really gotten more diverse at all. I'm looking at you, Hanover. <laughs> and yet, and yet, the map of where Obama gained has very little resemblance to where demographic shifts happened. And once again, I'm looking at you, Hanover here in blue, where the Democrats have made big gains with no demographic shifts at all. And as is the case here in Hanover, a lot of those places are white. Here in the parts of the country that are majority white, Barack Obama made gains among white, in white communities across the northern half of the United States. And obviously there's a very different story once you head south of the Mason-Dixon line, which is cuts right across here, and even further south, where the gains are, are truly massive for the Republicans. And all of these voters could potentially go back to the Republicans. They voted for Bush or Gore. I'm sorry, they voted for Bush in one of those elections. Why couldn't they vote Republican again? Um, and you can see these shifts among white voters outside of the South. Democrats gained. So the Democrats are winning white, or maybe winning white, many kinds of white voters who not too long ago had sympathies for the Republican Party. On the other hand, you can see that all of these national gains among white voters that have dominated our racial polarization narrative are from very narrow groups. White Southerners, older white voters have overwhelmingly shifted to the GOP. And that's left us with a really racially polarized country geographically. So this is a map that I don't think we've published yet. It's of how white voters broke by region or by county. And you can see that white voters overwhelmingly supported Mitt Romney in the South and that Obama actually won white voters in many parts of the northern United States, um, including here in Hanover. Um, the simplest explanation for this split is religion. Oh, this, 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 just, just to be clear first, this is sized by population. So you can see that many of the areas that were in red are not very populated. Um, and many of the most democratic areas are larger cities, whether it's Detroit or Chicago or the big metropolitan areas um, along the coasts. But the biggest explanation for this is religion, that there are a large number of conservatives in the South. Um, and in the places where there are not very many evangelicals or Mormons, the Democrats are very competitive among white voters. And this is the danger for Hillary Clinton. Because the Democrats are still very dependent on white working class voters, particularly in those communities across the North. In fact, in 2012, the single largest demographic group that voted for Obama, if you look at it in terms of a share of the coalition that voted for him, white voters got a college degree. 34% of the people that voted for Barack Obama were white voters who didn't graduate from college. That's more than black voters, more than Hispanics, more than white voters with a college degree. So, there is a lot of room for the Democrats to fall if the Republicans could ever come up with a candidate who could make inroads among these white voters without a college degree, particularly in these less religious communities across the North. And I would note that although you might look at Hanover and say, of course, Hanover's voting for Democrats, it's a, it's a college town. A lot of these communities up here are not college towns. Um, Scranton, Pennsylvania, not a college town. Or if it is a college town, that's not the reason why it's voting for Democrats. And, <laughs> These old industrial communities across the northern United States, whether it's Flint, Michigan, or it's um, Youngstown, Ohio, these are places where there are a lot of less educated white voters who could potentially appeal to Don, who Donald Trump could potentially appeal to, um, but who have voted for Democrats in recent cycles. Um, and the Democrats are really are vulnerable. This is from polling this year. White voters without a college degree. You can see that Donald Trump right now is doing as well as Mitt Romney did among white voters without a college degree in current polls, while Hillary Clinton is doing worse. And I want to note that this is because after Hillary Clinton won the nomination, uh, her numbers increased slightly. Um, and so I've decided to indicate that there's some uncertainty about where these lines might actually be at the moment, because <coughs> this is a relatively small amount of data after she's won the nomination. Uh, but no matter how you look at it, Hillary Clinton is doing worse among white voters than President Obama. 
um, even though President Obama was widely regarded as a weak candidate among white voters, and even though um, the traditional story of his reelection was that he won in spite of weakness among white voters. And I don't think we should be very surprised that the Democrats have this vulnerability. This is how white Democrats, Democrats without a college degree feel about the issues that Donald Trump is talking about. 45% of white Democrats without a college degree, according to data from Pew Research, believe that gun rights are more important than gun control. Think we should get, 40% think we should get tougher with China on economic issues. 39% think that free trade is bad, uh, to go to a totally different segment of Trumpism uh, on immigration and whether newcomers threaten traditional values, mid-30s, take Trump's position. So a huge chunk of the Democrats who make up the largest single block of some people who voted for Barack Obama in 2012 might be buying what Donald Trump is selling on both economics and culture. And that means that even Obama's America is potentially susceptible uh, to turn his way. And I think it's worth noting that these racial and immigration issues in particular may be, particular, may be especially important uh, to these voters. This is a, another Pew research, and um, the people in the lower right part of the audience from my um, <coughs> perspective will recognize these as coefficients from a regression. And what it shows is that if you, if you agreed with Donald Trump that newcomers from other countries threaten US values, you were 18 percentage points more likely to have a favorable view of him, controlling for everything else, even if you were, if you were a Democrat, if you had other views, that one question alone really moves the needle on whether you like him or not. And there's a, there's a very predictable geography to this sort of racial resentment and it shows up in the Republican primary. It shows up in the Obama elections. It shows up here in where people uh, have racially charged internet searches. And racially charged is a generous word here. It includes uh, you know, the N-word and derivatives of it. And you can see that the, the places that have this sort of, that where, where people are likeliest to have those searches are clustered across the South and the industrial eastern part of the United States. And on the right, you have a very similar map from a different measure. And, Admit, and admittedly not a necessarily representative measure, which is the mean uh, score of people on the implicit association test. I don't know if you've taken these before, but you see pictures of um, black or white people, and there is a word underneath it like, you know, good or bad or evil. And how quickly you appropriately sort them um, is supposed to be a measure of whether you have an implicit racial bias. So if it takes you longer to decide that uh, this person is black and good than it would for you to determine that if they're white, I may be explaining this somewhat off, but, it's the, but the basic principle is that it's about how much time it takes you to um, be able to identify a non-white person as, black, as, as good compared to a white person. And once again, um, the same pattern emerges. Um, it's also a pattern that shows up in manufacturing jobs to some extent. The industrial half of the United States is in the East. It's concentrated in the industrial Midwest, but also there are a lot of manufacturing jobs in the South. And so all of this comes together, and there's a coherent picture of how Democrats could be pretty vulnerable in this election. The areas of the country that are historically most dependent on trade, where there's traditionally high levels of racial resentment, and where there are a large number of white working class Democrats, all sort of come together in the upper Midwest. And again, you know, some of these communities, the Democrats are going to do just fine, like Athens, Ohio, or Philadelphia, or in Brooklyn. There are a lot of real white liberals there. But other towns here, you know, Scranton, 60% for Obama among white voters. There's a lot of room to fall there if you take all the points I just made about how white Democrats without a degree feel um, about trade, about race, and about um, other issues that Trump is talking about. Uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, Youngstown, Ohio. These are not towns with colleges. These are not towns with hipsters. They're white working class Democrats who've been voting Democratic for a long time. And Flint, Michigan, or Saginaw, and so on. And these are the communities where Donald Trump can hope to make big inroads. And it's a pattern that we're seeing across the developed world, which is that in these areas where Democrats used to fare well, or sorry, where the left used to fare well among um, 
the white industrial class. Populism is doing pretty well. So this is the result of the Brexit vote. And I'm sorry this is labeled poorly, but this is the result of the Brexit vote and the UK parliamentary election. On the left is the parliamentary election. And in the United Kingdom and often in the rest of the world, the left is, is signified by red, not blue. And so red is labor, um, which is the, the more liberal party in the United Kingdom. And you can see they do well in certain parts of London. And in this old industrial belt across the Midland region um, and up in the northeastern part um, of England near Newcastle. These are sort of the Pennsylvanias and Ohios of the United Kingdom. And I would take that analogy really far. You know, unlike the American South, where Republicans do really well among white voters, these are more secular places, again, like the North. These are places um, that have traditionally voted for the Liberal Party. These are places that have suffered often the very same economic changes that have happened in the United States. And now look at the Brexit vote. Liverpool, the cities of Liverpool and Manchester voted uh, to remain in the United Kingdom, but all of this industrial stretch across central, uh, across the north central, across north central England voted uh, to leave the European Union, as did those industrial areas um, south of Newcastle and the northern part of England. The Remain vote made up some ground in traditionally conservative parts of southern England that are fairly well educated and would be fairly reminiscent, frankly, of a place like New Hampshire and New England. But that was not enough uh, to cancel out the losses in the northern part of the country compared to um, Labor's traditional support. And so, I, you know, when I, and this is not just a pattern in the United Kingdom, it's a pattern in Austria where a far right candidate barely Actually, if I recall, and someone could correct me, did, weren't the results of this election recently invalidated by the court there? So I guess I, so, the, so there w it was an extremely close election in Austria between the Green Party and a far right populist. And the results of this election were recently invalidated. The Green Party initially won. Um, but much like this, there was the same pattern where in the old bastions of the left, the areas that were <laughs> carried by social Democrats a decade ago in Austria, the right was faring well. So this is the vulnerability that Democrats have and that uh, the industrial left, the former industrial left has across uh, the developed world. And if Hillary Clinton um, suffered this fate particularly badly and lost states like Ohio and Pennsylvania, uh, it would be really bad for her. The good news, though, if you're a Democratic supporter, is that Trump is losing among well-educated voters. And so, there's, so, so far, the gains that we establish that he's making, or at least the losses that Hillary Clinton is suffering among less educated white voters are neatly being canceled out among well-educated white voters. And as you can see, Clinton is leading among white voters with a college degree, even though Barack Obama lost these voters by a comfortable margin eight years ago, four years ago. She's doing better than Obama did in pre-election polls in 2008. And so that's a, uh, that, that, that helps make up ground. If, you, if you're Donald Trump and you are starting from a losing hand where Barack Obama won in 2012, you gain some ground back with less educated white voters, but you take a step right back with well-educated voters and you haven't made too many gains in the aggregate. And he also has a fairly unsurprising problem, which is that Clinton is matching or exceeding Obama among non-white voters. Um, it doesn't seem like Clinton is doing that much better than Obama among non-white voters, which is interesting. Um, you you might have thought that Trump's support among Hispanic voters, for instance, would collapse. That's not clear yet. Or Romney's support among Hispanic voters. Um, it's not clear yet that, that Donald <coughs> Trump is doing that much worse um, among Hispanic voters than Mitt Romney did, but we'll see. And at the same time, it is fairly clear that Clinton may not quite do as well among Obama as black voters, I'm sorry, among black voters as Obama did um, in 2012, even if she'll clearly do extremely well. But the basic problem for Trump is that, you know, Compared to where we were in 2012, he's losing ground among a majority of the electorate. He's losing ground among non-white or Hispanic voters, and he's losing ground among white college-educated voters. And although he may be making some of that ground back with what less educated white voters, it's roughly canceling out. And that leaves you with Clinton plus six. You know, four years ago, Obama won an election by four points. And right now, they're roughly trading. Um, where we, we took the election that we had four years ago and everything's gotten a little bit more extreme in my view. The Democrats were already better among well-educated voters and less educated white voters. That gap has doubled. The Democrats were already better among non-white voters than white voters. That gap has not doubled, but it has grown a little larger. And the result is that we basically have the same overall outcome, maybe a little better for Democrats, at least 
at the moment. Um, but we end up with a more polarized country. And it is a country that I think Donald Trump you know, could win if he could hold back his losses a bit among well-educated white voters or if minority turnout was lower. Um, there are clearly enough white working class voters for him to win given the gains that he's made. Here's, I didn't put a slide together for this. I'm just, it's dawning on me now that I ought to have. But if, if, Donald, if, Donald, if these two lines here were flat, if Donald Trump wasn't losing ground among non-white and Hispanic voters and he wasn't losing ground among well-educated white voters and he could make these gains among white voters without a degree, he would win the election. Now, or it would be roughly tied. Um, because of the Electoral College having a disproportionate number of white working class states, it would, it would potentially win the election. But in terms of the popular vote, it would be roughly tied. Now, I tend to think that it's very difficult for a candidate to make narrow gains among one group without alienating everyone else. Donald Trump is showing us that, right? The things that he's doing that are appealing to well-educated white voters have an equal and opposite reaction. So I don't think that this, sort of anal that this analysis um, is the reason why Donald Trump is losing, uh, but I think it shows um, why he's losing. And sorry, that's not clear. It's not, the reason why Donald Trump is losing is not because of these demographic features, but that is how his problems are manifesting themselves. And that's important to understanding what's happening in the United States today and why we still have a democratic-leaning country, um, at least at the moment, um, despite a candidate who is very different than what we've seen in recent elections. And that's all um, that I have on the prepared front. And hopefully I got through that in a reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, so uh, we have about 30 minutes for questions. Um, there are gonna be microphones. If you can please wait for the microphone so that the folks in the other room can hear you, that would be great. Um, if, you just, if you're interested in asking a question, please just raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you. One second. Soon we'll have a microphone. All right. Great. All right. Can I do Tom right there? Uh, thank you. I wonder if you could say a word about the uh, fact that most of the uh, states uh, are in uh, Republican hands, and uh, the House is clearly uh, that way, uh, and whether that trend is going to change or break in your analysis of uh, the uh, next election. Well, is this, do I still have the ability to, to show this first slide again? Maybe I do. I don't know if it's going to show up here. The, so here's Obama's America, and you know, you, you, there were two halves of your question. The first was about the House of Representatives, or the second was about the House of Representatives, and I'll, I'll address that first. There's a lot of red on this map, and the reason there's a lot of red on this map is because the Republicans um, carry white working class voters in the countryside by a considerable margin. The Democrats run up the score with huge margins among non-white voters and among urban white voters. And those margins are not represented on this map, right? Because the city is very small, but there are a lot of voters there. And that has huge consequences for the House of Representatives because under um, the conventions for how you draw districts fairly, which is to say compactly to represent um, non-white communities and to represent communities of interest, to follow the lines of jurisdiction like, city, like uh, city limits or county lines, you end up drawing congressional districts that lock Democratic voters into these very small areas where they run up huge margins. So you have a congressional district in a place like Philadelphia where they win 80-20 while a, a similar district drawn under the same rules in rural Pennsylvania will only be 60-40 for the Republicans. And that basic inefficiency in the, Democratic, in the Democrats running up the score in non-white urban and, and urban areas means that the Democrats are basically wasting votes. They're winning presidential elections with voters that they can't use to win the House because they all live in the same spot. Um, that's tough for them to overcome. Uh, the Republicans have made that problem even worse for the Democrats because um, of partisan gerrymandering in a host of states like Ohio and Pennsylvania and North Carolina. Um, I think that even if Donald Trump won this election by, I'm sorry, lost this election by a, a landslide margin, you would still wonder whether the Democrats would be able to take, out the, take back the House, even in that event. Um, the, the state houses is an interesting question, and it arises from a weird peculiarity of American elections, which is that most of the gubernatorial and state house contests in America are held during midterm election years. They're not held during general elections. 
Uh, there are some states where they're held during general elections, um, like my home state of Washington or Montana and Missouri and West Virginia, but for the most part, they're held in midterm elections. And that's been bad for the Democrats for two reasons. One is that the president's party tends to fare poorly in midterm elections, and the Democrats happen to have held the presidency. And the second reason is that, the Democrat, is that turnout is lower in midterm elections, and Democrats are heavily dependent on turnout from irregular voters. And that's a structural problem that they're gonna deal with for a long time until um, either their coalition gets a little older or they start faring better among older voters. Um, and so, and, or they start losing the presidency and start having the advantage <laughs> of having the wind at their back again like they did in 2006 when they swept so many of these same ha state houses. And I think that given that Clinton is a favorite to win this time, uh, you would have to think that the Democrats would once again start as an underdog in the state houses in 2018. Thanks, that was a really interesting presentation. Um, I was wondering when you showed us the calculations of how Trump's gains among uh, low education whites are sort of offset by his losses among non-whites and highly educated whites. Um, what sort of assumptions are you making about turnout among various subgroups, because you know. So, one, so there are, when I, when I make that sort of claim, I usually check two things. Uh, so I, all this data emerges out of census turnout data and census demographic data. And the best thing that I can do with that data is to mix and match the turnout from different elections. So I can say, okay, what if the turnout was like it was in 2004 or 2000? versus what if it was the same as it was in 2008 or 2012. And if my argument hinges on its one or the other turnout assumption, I'm generally not gonna make it in front of you. In this case, um, regardless of whether you accept the turnout from 2012, where there was a relatively low turnout among white voters, and particularly less educated white voters, uh, and when there was a high black turnout, the argument would still hold uh, that, there would, that the current gains that Trump is making would be sufficient um, for Donald Trump to, to basically fight back to a draw and win the Electoral College if you assume that his gains among white voters were distributed uniformly. And the basic reason for that is that there are a lot of white voters without a college degree in the country. Um, in 2012, 40, I believe 44%, it's on one of the slides, 44% of the electorate was white voters without a college degree. And with that, with that number, you know, even if their turnout is quite low, which it has been in recent elections, they're going to represent a significant chunk of the electorate. Thanks. I'm intrigued by your, uh, your suggestion that, the, that um, taking a new position basically is almost a zero-sum game for candidates, but I wonder about free trade for the Democrats. It's not historically been part of their, like, the union-oriented component, and if you look at your regression components and play that through, is there an upside for the Democrats of going back to a protectionist uh, status, uh, particularly with the uh, working-class white voters? So that's, I mean, that's an interesting question, and I, I don't know the answer to it. Um, my hunch, though, just looking at the aggregate data, is that the country is basically divided on free trade and that voters, at least in the data sets that we have in the past, and maybe this has changed in an election in which Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders have both elevated the issue, but in the past, voters haven't felt very strongly about it either. Um, and so based on, that, based on those two things, relatively low salience in the minds of voters and a relatively divided country on the issue, I would guess that it's another scenario where there's a trade-off or... Um, if, and, and there may not even be great magnitude to that trade-off in either direction. Um, that may not be true today. Uh, so there's a lot of speculation over the last couple of weeks about vice presidential picks. My question is twofold. Uh, do you think that vice presidents matter? And if Donald Trump picks Mike Pence, an industrial, a governor from an industrial state in the Midwest, um, do you think that'll have a bigger effect on those voters you were talking about in Youngstown, Ohio, Scranton, places like that? So I, I have not really been sold by the evidence that vice presidents matter very much, and I am not even sold that Sarah Palin made much of a difference. There are some political scientists who have argued with varying degrees of persuasiveness that she hurt uh, John McCain. I'm not totally sold. I just, I, I don't think that it's, I don't think it's clear. I think that once again, it was a case, there it could be a case that it was, there was a trade-off um, that, yeah, she probably hurt the Republicans a lot among well-educated voters, but you look at how well uh, the Republicans held up in, in 
culturally conservative parts of the country that voted for Bill Clinton, you wonder whether she hurt. And according to surveys, she didn't hurt, the exit poll surveys. Um, and the overall election result was that Obama won it by seven points, which was given the state of the national economy and given <laughs> George W. Bush's approval rating and given that the candidate, given that the president's party was seeking a third term is not a huge, it's not a crazy result. Um, so if Sarah Palin hurt that bad, it was hard to tell. Um, and I don't, and I think that probably works the other way. I think it's even harder to argue that they help. Um, in terms of the industrial Midwest, I, I don't think Mike Pence is a great fit, oddly enough. He's succeeded in Indiana, but he doesn't really complement uh, Trump's message on economic issues. He has been against, he was strongly for the TPP. He's a longtime supporter of NAFTA. Um, he is a traditional conservative. And I would note that traditional conservatives have not done well among white working class voters in all these areas. Um, and that, so I, I don't think that there's much reason to think that going back to that message will turn these areas, these areas red um, that in the past had stayed blue when confronted with those same policy viewpoints. The question is about volatility and um, candidates down the ticket. Uh, on the volatility side, I anticipate, because you never know what's going to emerge from Donald Trump's mouth from one day to the next, um, that uh, quite apart from the conventions, which will be an entertainment event, um, um, I am anticipating, and I'm curious as, your, as to your view, that, that this will be from week to week more volatile and thus less predictable. Um, and thus the, the switchable voters, um, there may be more of them than we think. The other part is the down market, um, the, um, uh, the number of Republicans who will be running away from Trump to try to hold their own seats. Um, and how will that, if at all, affect the top of the ticket? So the first half, volatility. I, I'm not sure I agree with you. And I say that in part based on what we've seen so far, and that's a relatively stable race. Do you see, do you see the, the chart early on? You might remember it about unfavorable ratings for Trump. They were the same the whole time. The, Amer the American people have had, have had a negative view of Donald Trump since day one. Now, he's moved around the people that don't like him. They used to be everyone, and now they're all Democrats. Um, <laughs> but he's stayed unpopular the whole time. Um, his race with Clinton has been relatively stable. And insofar as the, the general election has been volatile, it's mainly been Clinton's number that's moved. And that's really interesting to me um, because it implies that maybe Trump isn't the, the factor that drives that volatility. My theory, and it's, I have no evidence to back it up, but my theory is that there are a lot of people that are going to vote for Clinton that really don't like the idea of, of the fact that they're going to vote for Clinton. They don't like her. They um, shake the, the pollster asks them on the phone, are you going to vote for Clinton or Trump? And they just sigh and shake their head and say no one. And when the news is a little better for Clinton, they'll say Clinton. But then a week happens like this FBI stuff, and they're like, oh, no, I'm not doing that. And you know, in the end, they probably will. But like, right now, they really don't want to admit that. And I think that um, you know, Donald Trump probably has that same problem, too, to some extent, among some well-educated, traditionally conservative voters, maybe Ted Cruz voters who don't want to vote for him. Um, but. It isn't showing up in his numbers quite as much, where there aren't these moments where Donald Trump jumps up in the polls in response to good news. It seems more to work in reverse. And the final thing I'd say is, you know, voters may not like either of these candidates, but they know these candidates really well. And my, you know, almost everyone has a formulated a view of either Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Their views may change slightly um, over time. But everyone in the world knows who these people are. This isn't Michael Dukakis being introduced on the world stage for the first time and getting faced with Willie Horton ads. Um, it's not John Kerry being introduced to the world for the first time and then getting hit by swift vote ads. And I think that builds in a level of resilience to both of them. Um, in terms of coattails, I, yeah, I, I don't know how much it'll help the Republicans that they can run away from him. Uh, my personal theory, again, I have no evidence, is that because Donald Trump is such a distinct brand, that makes it easier for Republicans to insulate themselves from him, but I don't know. Thanks. Um, I had one kind of technical question about one of the sh slides you showed, and Are then um, also 
a broader question off of what you just said in response to that question. Uh, the technical question is why did you use the 2010 UK election results rather than the like five years more recent 2015 results? I think it is the 2015 result. No, it's not. The Lib Dems well, are, are down to eight seats now, so then that shows 57. Well, um, I intended to use the 2015 result. No. And <laughs> I am not a good enough observer of the, of the Liberal Democrats to have made that observation. Um, and then the second part is... Uh, but I think the point, I think one thing I'll note though, Having, having Google imaged mm -hmm. UK presidential, UK parliamentary election results. And I also, I didn't just look back at um, 2015 and 2010, I also looked at the Blair elections. Mm -hmm. And like the United States, they have very consistent geographic patterns where labor, when they win, excels in this industrial Midlands part of the country. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's the, that's the most salient point, which is that this area that reliably, even when, that, that, the, that, the, that these reliably labor areas in the industrial part of the country uh, revolted against. Uh, yeah. the European Union. And then the I second, oh, sorry, um, second part was just, uh, in the UK there's a tradition of polling slightly underestimating the Conservative Party. Um, 1992 and 2015 are the most notable examples. Um, and it's kind of the same thing that you're talking about with Clinton, where people may not love them or may not want to say that they're voting for them. It's not really the interesting choice or the fun choice, um, but it's kind of a steady hand. And do you think that we're beginning to see that kind of conversely with the Democrats, um, where it's rather than quiet conservatives, we have quiet, you know, moderates and liberals who are supporting? So I, one thing, you know, there are a lot of like theories that float around in the United States about different types of biases in the polls that, you know, there are, you know, shy Trump voters and that there are polls that, you know, underestimate um, the, Dem the Democrats because they don't contact enough non-white voters or young voters or they don't have enough cell phones in their surveys. And there are some instances where these methodological questions are actually true. But for the most part, like, there's not a lot of data to back up the idea that our polls are especially biased over time. Um, our polls aren't perfect, um, but there's not a long-term pattern of, of one side um, doing better or worse than them. I'm not a close observer of UK polling. It's very different than American polling in a lot of ways. And since my job is primarily about the United States, I have not taken the time to become an expert in the intricacies of UK polling methodology. What I will say, though, is that given our experience in the United States, I am instinctively skeptical um, of the idea that a couple of polling errors in 92 or 2015 is a sufficient basis to believe that the polls systematically underestimate one voter group um, because they're reluctant to divulge their opinions to pollsters. Um, so the slide that you showed with the, I think, uh, coefficient of 18 that was like racial immigration is one of the most important issues for people looking at Trump favorably. Um, like Trump's made it very clear that he wants to do a bunch of ridiculous things, build a wall, he doesn't want people in. But I don't think that Hillary has like sort of made it clear that she wants open borders or closed borders is sort of like playing a little bit more close to the vest. Do you think that if Hillary came out um, and was a little bit more explicit about um, like closed borders or not supporting a ton of immigration quotas, et cetera, any of those things, it would work in her favor? Or can you explain more like how racial immigration structures that relationship, if that makes sense? So I guess I have, I, I would say two things. One is that, you know, as I've sort of suggested, in general, I think most things come with trade-offs. I think that for every, if Hillary said she wanted to close the border, you know, she, perhaps that would insulate her to some extent from criticism among less educated white voters, but it would have a real trade-off among Hispanic and non-white voters. Um, whether that's a trade that works in her favor, I have no idea. The second thing I'll say is that um, I do think that, you know, the polling data itself doesn't provide a reason to think that um, one of those options for Hillary is more or less popular. But when I look at what Hillary needs to do to win, I would not, I don't think that's an issue where I would make a change. I basically look at it like this. I think that there's nothing Hillary can do to win back less educated white voters who have moved to Trump in mass. I think that that's underlined by a lot of demographic, by a lot of political shifts over the last decade. These same things, by the way, I didn't have a slide on this, but the same trends show up in the president's approval rating as well, which is relevant to me in terms of whether these are people that are likely to be won back by Hillary later in the process. And I kind of think that there are two groups of voters that get Hillary from here, which is like maybe 45% of the vote, to victory. One of those voters is, one, one group is to lock down these well-educated voters that are currently undecided about um, Trump and that you know, Clinton currently leads among. 
And the other group is to reunite um, the, the Democrats that supported Bernie Sanders in the primary, but that um, appear to be somewhat skeptical of Clinton. There are some places where I think that's a bad trade-off for her, like choosing Elizabeth Warren as VP, which I'll answer a free question, you know, has, a, has, a, has an equal trade-off for me among those two groups. It does help her among the left, but do these well-educated Republican voters in the suburbs who are wealthy but don't like Trump, is that the person that's gonna help Clinton seal the deal there? I don't know, so I think there's a trade-off. Um, immigration, I don't think helps her with either of those two groups. Sorry, closed borders, to be clear. According to the most recent national poll, Trump and Hillary are now tied. Okay, uh, given that, um, my feeling is that the upcoming debates are really going to decide this election. I'd like your viewpoint on that. So I'm not sure I share the view that the race is tied. I do, I do take the point that the most recent national survey does show a tied race. That poll, by the way, is also from my organization. And it's a very, very good poll. Um, <laughs> But the balance, of, the, balance of, the balance of data, as was on that slide with a whole bunch of blue, blue Clintons on it, suggests that Clinton is in the lead. And you know, if Clinton has a six-point lead or a four-point lead, maybe even less than that, you, know, you would still expect there to be polls that showed a tied race here and there, just as you would expect on the other end there to occasionally be polls that show Clinton up by double digits. Um, the battleground state polls show the same thing. So I don't, I don't think I accept the, the premise that the race um, that the fairest number for where the race stands today is a tide, even if the most recent poll has that number. Um, I do think the debates could be important. Historically, it's, like, it's, it's not very easy to prove that debates really have made a difference. In fact, you can write very good blog posts arguing that they don't. I've, made, I've written that blog post. <laughs> um, I don't know that I believe that entirely, but it, it, you, you, it's, it's cert there's certainly not much evidence that they do. In this year, I could be open to the argument that it's more important. If you buy that the, biggest, and that the biggest problem with Donald Trump and his chances isn't all this demographic stuff, like I argue, but is in fact related to him personally, uh, then the debate would be an important opportunity for him to reverse that view. I think that the convention is also an important opportunity for him to reverse that view. Um, I think that if Donald Trump doesn't start making inroads on these problems before October, I find it hard to imagine that even a stellar debate performance is going to cause people to fundamentally reevaluate him. People are going to have pretty hard views of him by that point, especially for a guy that they've seen in the national spotlight for a couple decades. And um, yeah, I, I think that, I, that that's, I guess we're all, all, sorry for tailing off there, but yeah, I, don't, I, I think that's the end of my thought, that I, I think it'd be pretty tough for, for Donald Trump if he can't make any gains on you know, these sort of personal questions between now and the debate for him to fundamentally change it at the end. Hi. Um, what are your thoughts on the role of women voters in the coming election? Yeah. Both because Trump has been, become notorious for making anti-women statements and because Clinton's the first major party candidate that's a woman. So I think it's a great question. It's one that I struggled with. That I, I struggle with. Um, and if you'll notice, in this, in this presentation, there, that gender didn't come up once. And that was intentional, and that I thought about it for a while. And I, you know, it's not clear to me that Hillary Clinton has a gender advantage or a gender penalty. I think it is clear that Hillary has a gender, that either Trump has a gender penalty or that Hillary has a gender advantage among women. And I think it's also clear that either Trump has a gender advantage or Clinton has a gender penalty among men. Um, the gender gaps are huge. I don't have a slide on it, but white college-educated women, according to the most recent Pew poll, are supporting Hillary by something like a 30-point margin. That is not normal. Um, white college-educated men are basically tied, um, which is basically normal. Uh, those charts I showed you on the attenuation of Clinton's support and less-educated white voters, all among men. Stable among women. So you have the symmetry on both ends where Okay, Clinton's clearly helped by education, but that's exclusively manifesting among women. And she's clearly hurt by education, and that's exclusively manifesting among men. Now, I have no idea whether that leaves us any differently than we would be <laughs> if, everyone was, if, if both candidates were, were women or both candidates were men. Um, I think it's really interesting. Um, and I get asked to write about it all the time, and I just don't know. 
Uh, thanks so much. This is really interesting. Um, given that Trump has had such consistently high unfavorable ratings, I was just wondering what your perspective is on how he became the nominee. Um, we have a lot to say about what, that. What <laughs> about the primary process? Was it too many opponents? Or what, like what, how yeah. is he the nominee favor and hate them so much? So I was definitely in the this can't happen camp at the beginning. <laughs> um, and I think there were a lot of, th I think that there are some things that, you know, we should have seen coming. Um, and then I think there are some things that I think were truly unique and hard to anticipate. And then there are some that are kind of in between. I think that one example that you gave, which is a really good one, is the number of opponents. There was an unusually number, there, there, there was an unusually high number of Republicans in that race. And if you buy that Donald Trump was a candidate who had this sort of resilient base of supporters, but that he might have been vulnerable in a one-on-one -on -one contest, then clearly, I think it's fair to say that a lot of people, myself included, if we could teleport ourselves back to July, should have said that with this many candidates in the race, there is no guarantee of a one-on-one -on -one contest against Donald Trump. And that wasn't something that got written very often, and I think it should have been. Um, there are other areas where I think um, we um, misunderstood him. It took me a long time to realize how much race was at the core of his appeal. Um, you know, clearly he started out from the very beginning talking about, you know, with the Hispanics are rapists comment or whatever. Um, but when the first polls came back, they showed he had this really diverse, co diverse, you know, for Republicans, coalition that, sp that spanned all relevant ideological and religious and regional groups in the party. And so I looked at that and I thought, here's a guy who's just doing well among everyone, but there's no core to what he has here. He's just a celebrity who's feeding off of the media. Once it became clear that, as you saw from that, you know, one, you know, chart that showed how much these racial issues power his support, I think we could have gone, I think I would have gone back and said, actually there is something really potent that underlies this and he's gonna be resilient. But that wasn't something I understood at the time. Um, that actually became most clear to me, did you, if, if you recall there was a map of racial resentment with Google searches. That map was what convinced me that this was it, that the Trump coalition was about um, racial resentment. And that has since been backed up by a lot of data um, that I think is more compelling than that map. Um, at the individual level, and, and you know, I would count that um, poll about how much uh, fear of newcomers influences favorability of Trump among them. And the final thing is, you know, I think that we gave too much credit to the Republican Party. You know, I think the Republican Party, I think that, look, parties are, you know, there's this whole theory for how um, parties influence elections that's relatively popular among political scientists, they can speak for themselves I suppose, um, <laughs> called the party decides that had some, that had, that had a lot of um, sway in the media in particular. And um, it supposes that, you know, there are a lot of actors and parties that make decisions um, that sort of end up, that end up encouraging parties to select broadly appealing candidates. You need that to fundraise. You need it to prevent other people from attacking you. And there's also a rational calculation that if everyone sort of bargains and makes sure everyone gets what they need, that they can come around to a broadly appealing candidate as well. And the Republican Party, I think, is just too fractured uh, to make that happen um, at this particular moment in a way that maybe wasn't true in 1996. And I could keep going, but I'm gonna cut it off there. <laughs> You haven't talked about what I consider the Nader effect. Those independents who are going to run that small percentage who is going to vote for none of the above. Would you comment? So it's a really good question. Um, <laughs> polls right now show something really interesting, which is that about 20% of voters, maybe a little less than that on average, are not willing to support either Trump or Clinton in the polls. They say other or neither or refuse to answer. Or if you give them a third party option, if you throw Jill Stein and Gary Johnson and they take it really fast. Um, historically, the number of people that support third party candidates declines over time. And, by, and then it declines even further on election day. Um, there are a lot of reasons why we can imagine that to be the case. Um, making your vote count. Maybe a lot of those people just end up, you know, if, you, if you're if people that they're not going to vote at all maybe. Um, if they don't want to support either of the main candidates. Um, but I do think you're right that in the end there will be a modest number, 
maybe not what the polls show now, but hey, maybe it's unusually high. Maybe it's over 5%, which would be unusual. Let's suppose it is that high um, of voters on both sides of the aisle um, who can't countenance either of the two candidates at the end of the race. Um, you know, my inst right now the polls say that it doesn't hurt anyone all that much more than the other. Sometimes the polls seem to suggest it hurts Trump more. Sometime, more recently, I think they're suggesting that they hurt Clinton more. Um, I think it's really hard to say whether any candidate is hurt all that much more than the other. What I think I can say is that if either candidate could fix this problem, if either candidate could get their voters, accept, could get their half of the country excited about voting for them, uh, they would be in a really good position. But neither candidate at the moment is fully unifying their, like the, the people that voted for Romney last time or the people that voted for Obama last time. Which is why both of them are in the low 40s. Uh, last question. I think you've been quoted as saying, don't worry about polls until October. Uh, for those of us, I don't remember saying that. <laughs> for those of us who can't take our eyes off this approaching train wreck, what do you suggest we look at between now and October? So I, you... I actually do think that the polls, a few weeks after the convention, start getting pretty relevant. Um, historically, the conventions are a moment when the parties can finally be fairly unified, um, and you know they're not perfect at that point, but I think they're worth looking at. I think that if August first, sorry, I guess I got a little later than that. Like August 10th comes around and the one candidate has a really clear lead, I think that's, that's quite noteworthy. Um, and then I would uh, you know, maybe turn your phone off. Um, I would encourage you to continue subscribing to the New York Times if you do so. But other than that, you know, go on vacation. <laughs> the biking up in northern New Hampshire, in northern Vermont was pretty good. It was a town called Burke. Please join me in thanking Nate for